public interest goals. What different public interest goals does food and agricultural policy seek to achieve, and how does it make trade-offs between them? The big theme is that the federal government doesn't just do any one thing in agricultural policy. So, for example, if you read the book by Michael Pollan, Omnivore's Dilemma, um, he's very concerned about a particular line, a particular theme of public policy that suppresses prices. He's very concerned about a cheap food policy. And the idea, I hear this all the time from my nutrition and public health colleagues, the concern is that maybe farm policy is promoting overconsumption of unhealthy food and that's in causing us increased rates of overweight and obesity and making us unhealthy. Um, it turns out that that type of policy is just one of many policy instruments that the federal government uses when it turns its attention to food and agriculture. And that it's important, even as outsiders, to have a bit of a sense of the lay of the land, a bit of a sense of the diversity of policy instruments that policymakers are using, because these instruments have very different effects on all the important things that we care about. They have different effects on nutrition, on the environment, and on the taxpayers' um, investment in these programs, on pretty much everything, on food prices, uh, you name it. Of the six, of these six policy instruments, the one I'm going to de delve in in more detail has to do with demand expansion. One of the things the federal government does is it just encourages people to consume more of agricultural products as a way of helping farmers by increasing demand for the goods that they provide. And I think that this is an area that's little understood, including within the applied economics profession. Um, and finally, once we know a little about food and agricultural policy, the question is, these, these policies are not above reproach. I mean, maybe somebody it occurs to somebody that they could be a little better, right? And the question is, how could that happen? I think it's important not just to put ourselves in the mental position of a benign dictator what would what would um, what would what policies would we support if somebody made us king? Right? Nobody's making us king. That's very much a hypothetical question. The the real world is um, decision making in our semi-functional democracy, and the question is what advocacy coalitions would be capable of being brought in for support on different policies that we might think of as being better than current policies. And so we'll spend some time reflecting on that. Um, this is a diagram that's very commonly seen in the public health literature. For example, this version of it appears in the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, the document that the federal government produces every five years to serve as kind of its authoritative statement on diet and health science. And what this diagram reflects is the public health and nutrition community's awareness that they need to pay attention to a whole lot of issues other than just nutrition. So in this picture, the, the author of this diagram is reflecting on what causes us to have elevated rates of overweight and obesity, for example. And they're thinking about proximate causes, causes like increased food intake or like reduced levels of physical activity. And these proximate causes are clearly central to the public health matter, but they're also so close that they're almost irrelevant because... It just begs the question, well, what caused increased food intake over time? Or what caused reduced levels of physical activity? It's almost tautological to say that um, our food energy balance is based on these two things. It makes no difference from a public policy perspective until we diagnose what's a little further afield. And recognizing this, the diagram starts to think about individual factors, um, demographic factors, uh, physical factors. The environmental setting, including the places where we make decisions about food and physical activity. The policy setting, including government, agriculture, the food industry. What you can see here is the public health community's awareness that if we're going to understand the important public health issues of the day, we need to know something about agricultural economics. We need to know something about how the food manufacturing industry works. And then more fundamental things that might be less amenable to change, the basic, the basic um, social environment in which, in which we live and develop and make our decisions. So here's why the conversation turns out to be difficult. 
is because if you start from a particular public interest goal, like nutrition and public health, although this is true also whether your public interest goal is environment or something else, but you start with that particular public interest goal and you start to engage in learning and conversation with people in these wider areas, like the food industry or uh, agricultural policy makers, it's almost unnerving. You find out that there's fundamental areas of disagreement about what's a good food price or what's a good bad food price, what foods should be supported by the government and what foods shouldn't. And at first, it's easy to dismiss that because we all tell each other stories in our mind about sort of why do people disagree with us? And the story often runs for all of us along the lines of, well, people disagree because I'm right. <laughs> And they've been affected by moneyed interests, right? Maybe, the, maybe uh, pe people with money and power have bought them off, and that's why they think wrong things and, and uh, don't agree with me. But what makes it really challenging is once you start to pay attention to some of these other areas of interest, you find very well-intentioned and persuasive people who care about other things that weren't on your list of goals initially. <laughs> so, for example, you're talking about agricultural policy, and you um, find yourself in conversation with people who care about the economic health of rural communities. And they care about the economic contribution that a thriving agriculture sector makes to our national economy. It helps our trade balance. They, they, they care about other things that can be persuasively articulated as public interest goals. And most outrageous of all, they don't think of food and beverage intake and physical activity as if they were kind of the sun at the center of the solar system. You can see that in this graph that food and physical activity are the center of things and these other more distant factors are outer orbits. Whereas as soon as you talk to somebody who cares about agricultural policy um, as their primary area of interest, you find that they're orb orbiting a different sun altogether. This doesn't work in sort of traditional Newtonian physics. That, that, that um, you, you find yourself having to think about trade-offs that people make between competing goals. It, it's, it's, it's easy to make policy decisions when one side of the argument is about the public interest and the other side is about particular private sector moneyed interest. But it's harder to make public, in, pub, it's harder to make public policy decisions when you're addressing competing trade-offs. What about policies that support food safety but at the expense of the interests of small farmers? or vice versa, right? So um, we had Julie Caswell visiting the campus yesterday talking about the new Food Safety Modernization Act, which requires trade-offs of just this type, and it pits one public interest organization against another. It pits sort of traditional food safety advocates against the interests of sustainable agriculture advocates, for example. And so we'll be thinking about how do we wrestle with that diversity of public interest goals. Even within the Farm Bill, so the major piece of legislation that authorizes most food and farm programs every five years, there's a diversity of public interest goals that are intended. So um, and most of you probably know, but in the public at large, um, it's not widely understood that the nutrition title is by far, in terms of billions of dollars, the largest title of the Farm Bill. So the Farm Bill um, uh, pays for, among other things, the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as food stamps. And because farmers are a very small sector of the national economy, you know, there's a couple million farms in the United States, but consumers, there's 100, uh, 100 million consuming households in the United States. So even when you're thinking about a program that only serves the interests of low-income consumers, it's easy for it to swamp in terms of dollars of investment, all the farm programs combined. Another thing that may not be widely recognized is the traditional price suppressing farm programs like deficiency payments turn out to be comparatively small while new policy instruments such as crop insurance turn out to be more central to the farm bill in recent years. That was true in this column which describes the 2008 farm bill and um, it's especially true in the new proposals um, for the Farm Bill that's not currently succeeding in passing through Congress. So the thing to recognize is that we need to um, understand different areas of public interest advocacy in order to be able to offer input on an omnibus legislation like the Farm Bill. They call it an omnibus legislation, meaning that it doesn't address just one issue, but it has a bunch of issues mm -hmm. combined.
when I hear the term omnibus legislation, it brings to mind, because the word omnibus in Spanish means like a, a city bus. Uh, it gives me this image of, a, of an old clunker diesel bus spewing uh, smoke and trying to make its way up a hill in some South American city. And it's not really a bad image for the farm bill, which is itself sometimes overburdened uh, with different, different people's input. Um, and uh, the, the, these, this diversity of interest is reflected also when you look in any particular year at USDA's budget. So nutrition assistance is about three quarters of USDA's budget. The traditional farm and commodity programs that we think of as it's what comes to mind first when we think of USDA is about 13%. Conservation programs um, are about 7%, and then all the other programs, including the Food Safety and Inspection Service, the Agricultural Marketing Service, and everything else combined is about 6%. Okay, so let's think about figuring out fundamentally what is going on with this variety of policy instruments. Um, First thing is, why are there such a variety of policy instruments? I, 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 I feel this sympathy for the policymakers who put together this kind of convoluted system. I, I, I think that they're, I sometimes think of them like um, laboratory rats in a maze designed by cruel scientists who didn't include an exit. So they're sort of running around trying one thing. They, they, they realize there's an important policy problem, like overproduction and unreasonably low commodity prices. And they know that in order to help farmers, they need to fix that. And then they will propose a policy instrument that addresses that issue. And over time, it becomes clear that that instrument introduces different problems of its own. And then they'll tack on a new, uh, a new policy that solves the new problems. And um, so on, the cycle continues. Here's the leading categories. So first, for example, we'll talk about price supports. Now, price supports are not the biggest policy instrument currently used, but they were an important part of federal agricultural policy from the 1930s till about the start of the 1970s. And to some extent, we've inherited, in a softer way, elements of price support policy still in the dairy program and when the um, you know, when commodities are bought up for the school meals program, commodities that are in excess production are bought up for school meals or for military commissaries, it's like a soft version of these um, older price support programs. And the most important thing about price support programs is that their goal is to increase the price. If you're thinking that the U.S. has a cheap food policy, it's clear that that's not the only thing going on because if you ask any farmer, these farmers that are supposedly running things and uh, uh, are responsible for these policies. Um, the farmers don't want low commodity prices. Any farmer in the world wants high commodity prices. Everything's going to seem topsy-turvy if you're under the impression that farmers want a cheap food policy. Farmers want food to be highly rewarded, right? They want it to be um, very profitable. And so the price support is a government program on years when the market price is low. So if there's a lot of commodity being supplied and the market price is low, the, the goal of the price support program is to not have farmers suffer under that low price, but instead to have a higher price. Now, if you just propose a higher price, it's nothing more than wishful thinking. A policy doesn't deserve the name price support unless it's got a support price combined with some mechanism that enforces that price. If you just announce the price, it, it becomes um, untenable. What happens as soon as you start to get people to sell the product at a price that's higher than the market equilibrium is that there's going to be a surplus on the market. At this particular elevated price, people aren't going to buy enough of the product. The producers are making too much money, so they're going to produce too much of it, and there's going to be a surplus on the market. And as soon as there's a surplus on the market for a particular agricultural commodity, there becomes intense pressure to lower the price. Imagine, none of these farmers wants to be the person holding the bag um, when the music stops and uh, 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 they find that there's one chair too few, right? Um, nobody wants to be the person who fails to sell their product. And so as soon as there's a surplus on the market, each business person has a strong incentive to lower the price a bit and um, to have the price return to the market price. And so what you need in order to enforce a support price is the government's agreement to, for example, to buy up a certain amount of the commodity and take it off the market. So here's how this works. 
On the vertical axis, of, uh, we have the price of, for example, corn in dollars per bushel. On the horizontal axis, we have the quantity of corn in billions of bushels. Um, you don't have to know economics to follow this. Um, all you have to notice is that the equilibrium price is a particular low amount, say $1.75, and that policymakers want the price on the market to be higher. Still, if you do want to follow the actual economics in the diagram, here's how it goes. Um, every line that economists put on a diagram has a story that goes with it. And in this case, the story is fairly easy to explain. For this demand function, the story is that when the price goes up, people buy less. You can see that it's downward sloping, which means that as the price goes up, people are going to buy less. It stands to reason that this is a plausible story, right? And the supply function means that as the price goes up, farmers are willing to produce more. They're able to bring more resources to bear in producing a particular crop, such as corn, if the price is higher compared to if the price is lower. At the support price, there's a surplus, meaning that the amount, the horizontal location that farmers want to produce on the supply function, is higher than the amount that people want to buy at that price. And that's the surplus, and that's the amount that the government has to buy. So the government buys this amount, this horizontal distance, at a support price of $2. Farmers are happy because they're making $2. They're not selling all their crop to the government. They're selling some of their crop to the government. Some of their crop is being sold to consumers, just as it always was. Um, but they're getting a higher price than they otherwise would get. Consumers aren't happy. They're paying a higher price than they would have paid otherwise. The consumers and the farmers are both getting this price of $2. Um, but in these price supports, the logic is consumers are hard to organize politically. The farmers are a very intense lobby. Um, there's some good public policy reasons why farmers are able to encourage policymakers to institute a policy like this. But there's problems, too. Among the problems are this encourages overproduction. It encourages farmers to produce more crop than they otherwise would. And this makes it more difficult to sustain the subsidy program in the long run. Um, it also means that certain public interest perspectives are going to be critical of this program. For example, um, our uh, environmentalists may find this an unattractive policy because it's encouraging farmers to produce more corn on you know, to produce corn, for example, on more environmentally sensi sensitive lands. Um, but it's also our trading partners. Our trading partners hate policies like this because um, often these the, the surplus that the government buys up gets dumped overseas. It's like these price support policies get public objection because these stocks are a big public information liability. Like for a journalist trying to do a story on dairy price supports, Nothing makes a better photograph than the piles of butter, in, like a billions of pounds of butter in some warehouse, right? The fact that the government has to buy up all this commodity and not feed it to people just rubs people the wrong way, right? So for a number of reasons, um, this ended up being a policy that came under pressure over time. This policy would be easier to sustain from the government's perspective if only the farmers would produce less in the first place, right? Imagine if there wasn't all that surplus to buy up, but that the farmers just followed the rules, didn't overproduce, um, produced only a certain quantity that um, with that sort of restrained quantity on the market, the price would be higher naturally. Consumers would still pay more. Farmers would be happy because they're getting a larger price, uh, but uh, just less would be produced. And you can see how this makes sense in years when there is overproduction. So if farmers are being too productive around the world, commodity prices are low, there's um, uh, marginal lands are being used, and that somebody's got to rein, rein in all of this, there's a number of constituencies who would like to have a smaller quantity of commodity produced. But some things go wrong also. For one thing, every farmer wants to be the farmer who's doing the production. Like, when you say, hey, let's just produce less, the question is, who is going to produce less? Um, that the government finds itself having to get involved in the nitty-gritty production details of farmers to an extent that's really awkward. 
So um, in some years, over the decades between the 1930s and the 1960s, there would be quota systems for particular crops where each farmer would be told, you've got to reduce how much you produce by 30%. So 70% of your production you can still do, 30% of your production you have to set aside. And um, here's a certificate that tells you what your production limit is and that it tells you the amount that you're not allowed to exceed. Or sometimes in years, for example, when hog hogs were in surplus, so that there were too many hogs on the market and there was concern that the price of hogs was too low, they would just um, kill lots of hogs and just not feed them, right? So there's, there's things about these supply controls that, that also um, are, are liabilities in terms of other, other public policy goals that we might want to achieve. Um, yeah? Are these demanded by farmers then? Is this lobby for farmers? Yes. This is a key thing. Is it seems at first like farmers only want to produce more and more, but that's not true. Goal number one for farmers is to have a high price. And so you'll often, if the farmers can... Um, uh, if the farmers can agree on how the quota system ought to work, they would like this policy. But the actual quota system, as it's operated, turns out to be so unpopular that, that this ends up um, having a lot of opposition, even from farm organizations. So in principle, farmers... Here, here's how it goes. Farmers want less commodity to be on the market, but they don't want the less commodity to be their production. They want somebody else to produce less, right? Um, in soybeans, the U.S. wants Brazil to produce less soybeans, and Brazil wants the U.S. to produce less soybeans. Everybody agrees there ought to be less soybeans produced, but nobody wants to be the person showing any restraint. And so um, uh, that's, how it, that's how it is with these supply controls. Now, the supply controls have survived, all, like the price supports, there's kind of echoes of it in current policy. And the, the surviving remnant it's like an appendix, right, uh, from, from an earlier um, evolutionary period, um, is in the conservation programs. So some of the conservation programs to this day involve land set-asides. And you might think, uh, well, the conservation programs, the main political constituency, must be environmentalists. But you'd be totally missing it if you didn't understand that the converse conservation programs are supported by a coalition of environmentalists and farm organizations. That they're, they're the two legs on which the conservation programs stand. The farmers like it because it keeps the price higher than it otherwise would be. And the conservation um, interests like it because it keeps marginal lands out of production and it avoids the incentive for overproduction. So the conservation reserve program lets farmers make proposals to the government on a voluntary basis about what land they're offering to set aside, and then they get a subsidy from the government that's um, set by a sort of a clearing mechanism. The government considers all the different proposals from the different farmers and makes a decision about where to draw the line and uh, what the payment per acre is going to be to the farmers who are willing to set some of their land aside. Any, any questions on that? Um, so you can see this, uh, this one has strengths and weaknesses, but over time, especially in times of scarcity, you can see that these nowadays commodity prices are higher, there's concern about hunger around the world, that it's going to, be, it, it's going to seem politically unattractive to shackle the productive power of the American farmer. Yeah. Uh, in the conservation programs, you said like the government draws that line and decides where, the, where it is. Who is the one drawing that line? Is that like FSA or right? NRCS or who's that? Right. Um, NRCS. And it's, um, uh, th th there's some of the nitty gritty of this I, don't full I haven't fully mastered. Um, but I think, I think uh, NRCS um, delegates it to um, regional offices and state offices and that each of them gets to have a priority setting process. So there's some, the conservation program at the national level will have this sort of carefully negotiated set of goals. Like as you're trying to pull um, marginal land out of production, what, what type of land? Is it land on slopes that you're trying to pull out? Is it land that's been eroded that you're trying to pull out? And then, um, and then the actual decision is made somewhat closer to the local level. Yeah. So deficiency payments. Deficiency payments are the type of program that Michael Pollan had in mind in his chapter about the cheap food policy. There's this great conversation between Michael Pollan and um, a farmer named George Naylor 
kind of a well-spoken farmer who is very good at explaining why the farmer's always got his back against the wall and um, about how the, the cheap food policy makes the farmer barely be able to afford a good living, and the farmer feels this intensity to produce more and more in order to pull themselves out of the hole that they're already in. So that's, that's the story of the conversation between Michael Pollan and um, a farmer, and this is the type of policy that they had in mind. So since the 1970s, um, there was a good deal of price support policy used this instrument. From, from, I would say from the 1970s until about 2005, this was an important policy instrument. And um, they, uh, what, what the government does is the government figures like this. We don't want to take stock. We don't want to take possession of all these large stocks of butter and corn and soybeans. We don't have big enough silos. We don't want the journalists looking at our big pile of uh, commodities. Um, so why don't we just write the farmer a check so that the farmer gets the amount per bushel that we were trying to support with our support price? So the idea is, um, if the support price, if the target price is two dollars, instead of offering to buy product at a price of two dollars, just let the product be sold on the market. Let the natural f forces of the market economy work and determine the market price, and the government will pay the farmer for the difference between that market price and the target price. And um, for both the price support and this, there's kind of um, like I'm explaining the heart of the matter. In terms of the actual mechanism the government uses, things are a little complicated. Um, they often use a loan program instead of just an outright check to the farmer. They use a loan program where you get to pay back your loan at a reduced rate. But it amounts to being the same as the government gives the farmer an amount per bushel that's the equ equivalent to the difference between the market price and the um, target price. So here, this is the same supply and demand as before. Once again, the market price is $1.75 and the target price is $2. Once again, the farmers are overproducing because they're getting a total value of $2 per bushel. Um, but um, when this amount of bushels, in this picture it's about 10.3 billion bushels, is on the market, it t it, consumers aren't going to buy that amount unless they get a fairly good low price for it. Um, it's like it, it, it takes one price to get consumers to absorb 9.7 billion bushels. But if you want consumers to absorb 10.3 billion bushels, you've got to give them a better deal. Otherwise, they're just going to say, hey, I don't want to consume that much, right? And so um, you might think that this deficiency, if the market price is $1.75 and the target price is $2, you might think, ah, oh, I bet the government has to pay a quarter per bushel. Right, 25 cents per bushel. But the sad story is that this 25 cents per bushel, the difference between $1.75 and the target price, is not the whole sum that the government has to pay. Unfortunately, once the farmers start producing more, there's a low consumer price that's required in order to get consumers to eat all of that. And um, uh, the difference between the consumer price and the target price is much bigger than 25 cents. So what looks like a program that might cost about $2.5 billion at first turns out, on some cases, to be much more expensive for the government. In this particular example, it's about 4 or $5 billion that the government would have to spend to support this deficiency payment. Um, okay, so there's reasons why deficiency payments have been set aside over the years. In a series of policy innovations from the 1970s, 90s um, through the current farm bill. The farm bill is every five years, about. Sometimes it takes six years, currently longer. Um, so, so in 1996, there was a farm bill. And uh, they started to experiment with avoiding the incentive that farmers have to overproduce. The idea is when you base farmers' decisions on the amount that they're getting per bushel, it stands to reason that farmers are going to produce a lot of bushels. But what if you just offered farmers that same sum of money, but you didn't make it depend on how many bushels they produced? This is very clever. You, an, an economist love this. Um, our trading partners like this, even environmentalists like this, because you get the farm subsidy without the overproduction. The hard thing is to decide 
who gets this fixed subsidy? If you're going to just have this direct payment to the farmers, you have to decide who gets this fixed subsidy. So they decided, let's base it on what you produced historically. So in some previous period of five years, you might have produced a certain amount of soybeans, that you get a subsidy for being a soybean farmer that's related to how much you produced in the past. It's not based on your current year's production in terms of bushels. It's just based on the fact that you're a soybean farmer operating on a certain scale. And um, so these direct payments have some good features in terms of distorting the consumer price less than other farm subsidies do. Um, they harm our trading partners less. They harm the environment less than other subsidies do. But they've got problems of their own. They're an attractive subsidy in years where everybody agreed that the farmers needed public support. But they start to look bad in years when the market price has become high. And the farmers are starting to earn household incomes that are much higher than the average income for the country at large. So during years when the crop price is very high, farmers are thriving, right? Especially com commercial, full-scale farmers are thriving. And um, if they're making good money, it's hard to justify, in addition to that good money, to have the government be paying them these direct subsidies. So currently, in a high-price environment, currently we're in a high food commodity price environment, um, these direct subsidies are slated for disappearing in both the House and the Senate version of the Farm Bill. So currently, the House and the Senate can't agree on a Farm Bill, but both of them have this feature that there's either no reliance or at least far, far less reliance on these direct subsidies. Insurance. Instead, both versions of the Farm Bill are increasingly relying on insurance programs. And insurance is because the traditional reason for farmers are ha for farmers to have insurance is because they, um, agriculture is a risky business. It's conducted, you may have noticed, outdoors, right? And so um, it's exposed to the weather. Um, there, there's the far farmers have a lot of things compared to people in other areas of industrial production that they can't control. And these things make their production vary from year to year. In addition, not only may bad weather happen to them and cause their production to suffer, but good weather may happen to them, which causes the market price to be lower. So the thing that's made a pessimist of many a farmer, and if you ever talk to a farmer, you may have noticed this theme of pessimism from time to time in their conversation, um, is because they can have bad times if the weather reduces their production, and they can also have bad times economically if the weather causes everybody to be succeeding in their production. Um, and so insurance traditionally help them avoid losses in their production, but the more recent insurance schemes are all about helping them avoid all kinds of risks, including both production risks and price risks. Yeah? Because I noticed on the other slide you showed it was increasing. Yes. That was the only thing that was increasing. Yes. Part of that because of like all of the droughts and stuff from climate yes. change that have been occurring in the... That, that's it. It's sort of concern about weather va variability is part of the reason. And the other part of the reason is because all these other subsidy programs each have their own things going wrong. So if you're, if you're kind of the farm policy organizations and you're determined to pull for subsidies, this is a, a more appealing one to um, support than price supports or deficiency payments or in some cases, direct payments. So it's in partly because of real things out in the actual production economy, and it's in partly because of political things that the farm policy has been increasingly relying on crop insurance. Now, the crop insurance, I think, I could, I think it's not speaking out of turn to say it's one of the shadier parts of US agricultural policy that there's a number of ways to game the system on crop insurance, even by comparison to other, other areas of, of um, farm subsidy programs. Um, you can see that the policymaker has a hard choice. If, if the policymaker has the insurance instrument pay out based on things that you actually decided to do as a farmer, the farmer may start to make production decisions with an eye towards the insurance payout rather than towards the um, actual economic value of their production. And so that leaves it tempting to the policymakers to say, you know what, I think that the um, 
insurance should not pay out based on your production experience, but instead, I better write the instrument so that it pays out based on the production experience of an average of farmers in your area. That way, each individual farmer doesn't have a disincentive to take good care with their production. Um, but once you start to base the insurance instrument on regional averages or statewide averages, you've reduced its ability to target the economic needs of each farmer. It just means that it, it means it means there's less risk of corruption and of um, sort of um, inappropriate economic incentives, but there's more risk that the insurance instrument isn't actually going to correctly match who needed the help in a particular year. I know for like car insurance, they correct in a lot of different ways um, based on your driving history and stuff. Are there ways to correct for the individual car right. based on similar? It's just like car insurance, where if you can imagine that the car insurance company has some hard choices about how precisely should they target particular people. If they target you based on, do you, like if you actually have an accident that you're, you have to pay more, well, that's no insurance at all. The whole point of insurance is that it's supposed to equalize, um, equalize the economic experience to some extent for people who do or who didn't have, have an accident. So the car insurance um, companies do try to um, make the insurance cost more based on broader characteristics that you share with other, other people. So for example, if you're a 17-year-old male, they turn out not to believe that they're mortal. Um, uh, so so the, the car insurance is going to be very expensive. Yeah. Um, demand expansion. So it's the only one that causes both the quantity consumed to go up and the price to go up is demand expansion. So what can the government do to just encourage private sector people to demand more of the farmer's product? There, you could try to get people to eat more tofu or something, but uh, it turns out that the, that the way the commodities are used for the big commodities, like corn and soybeans, that they're largely used as animal feed. So that if the federal government wants to encourage demand for corn and soybeans and for the major row crops, what it really has to do is encourage demand for meat. And so we'll be talking about demand for meat. Um, and the other thing is biofuels. So if the federal government um, declares that a certain fraction of the gasoline in our automobile tanks has to be a major source of new demand for corn producers, and it's something that just looks golden from the corn producer's Perspective. It's something that, that really has made a big difference in increasing corn prices in recent years. You can see who doesn't like such policies. I mean, in, a, in t times when the world is going hungry, um, it starts to look very bad to burn up all our corn in our automobile tanks. The thing is, uh, once you start to pay attention to um, uh, the diversity of policy instruments, you realize we have to think quantitatively. There's no getting around it. Even if we're humanities people or social sciences people, we can't understand food policy unless we're willing to think about how are the amounts of these different, um, these different uh, subsidies used from year to year. And what you see as, this is a chart. It, I, I, I made this one slightly simpler, but you'll see charts like this on USDA's Economic Research Services website when it comes back up. And uh, the, um, the, uh, the thing is, this is like the classic example of a chart that I think is designed to say, not your business, to nine-tenths of the American thinking public that might have come across this chart. And now you are already all prepared to sort of understand what's interesting going on in a chart like this. Um, that You see that the billions of dollars on the vertical axis that the federal government spends on different kinds of farm support programs varies drastically from year to year. So in one year, it might be $25 billion. And in another year, it might be less than $10 billion. And you can see why it is. In years when the market price is low, so in years when there's a lot of production on world markets and the market price is low for the leading crops, like in 2004, 2005, and in 1988 to 2000, 
the subsidy programs are very expensive. These deficiency payments are expensive because the government has to pay a big gap between the market price and the target price. And many billions of dollars are spent on these price supports and deficiency payments. In other years, when the market price is high, like recent years, even without Congress writing any change into the law, the amount gets very small. Because um, it's not like Congress had to say, hey, the market price is high, let's get rid of that subsidy program. Instead, the subsidy program just isn't even in the money. It's like um, the, if, if farmers are getting paid the difference between the market price and the target price, but the market price actually is above the target price, the farmers don't get paid anything, right? And so um, uh, these subsidy programs are inexpensive in recent years, even without a policy change. What stays expensive is the direct payments. So you can see that instead of fluctuating with prices, the direct payments are very steady, right? The crop insurance, it's a little harder to see, but it starts out small in early years and then has been a bigger part of farm policy in recent years. The conservation programs are smaller overall. On the previous slide, it went up to $30 billion. Here, it only goes up to $7 billion. But still, the trend over time is for the conservation program spending to somewhat increase over time. The, um, there's, a, there's other clever charts. Maybe I won't go into this one. Well, uh, just a little. So the, 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 this chart, um, the other instrument that the government uses to help farmers is trade policy. If the government puts up a tariff that um, makes it more expensive for farmers overseas to sell their products in the United States. The goal is to help domestic farmers by raising our prices. For example, in dairy. In dairy, um, the world price is um, lower than the domestic price. And so farmers overseas would like to sell dairy in the United States, but we have a, a trade barrier that keeps them from selling dairy products um, in the United States. And um, it doesn't cost the government anything. So at first, it's hard to figure out how do you calculate quantitatively what's the effect of those tariffs or those quotas on, in terms of trade policy. Because the government doesn't even have to put it on the budget. The government doesn't have to pay the farmers a certain number of billions of dollars. It's money that is essentially coming from the consumers to the farmers in the form of the higher prices that the farmers get in the United States. And, um, but the, our, our international trading organizations, like this is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is kind of a club for rich countries. Um, uh, they, they're the ones who care about figuring out all this arcane <coughs> nitty-gritty of U.S. farm and trade policy because they're the one whose farmers have to compete with U.S. farmers. And so they've done very well at quantifying what is the effect of these um, tariffs and quotas and put them, enumerated them in the same scale that you can enumerate farm programs in billions of dollars. So here in these horizontal lines, um, I want market price support. I think it's the second area. Um, market price support, like the subsidy programs, is high in years when the market price is low, um, but then it diminishes to being not all that important in years when the market price is high. When the world price for dairy is high, um, we don't need a trade barrier, right? The, the, US, the U.S. price of dairy and the world price of dairy are the same anyway. And so um, that's why these uh, trade barriers don't make much different in recent years when world commodity prices are high. Okay, so now I'll say a little more about demand expansion. Because among agricultural economists, I think this is the one that's most neglected. Like you could go to ag econ conferences and uh, think that a whole lot of what was going on was about deficiency payments or direct payments or crop insurance. And um, so the government influences our food demand in many ways, one of which is just through its nutrition education. So you think of this MyPlate document, which stands out because it's clearly encouraging us to consume more fruits and vegetables and more whole grains than we do on average. But this isn't the federal government's only messaging and activity in the area of managing demand. Um, as you said, the Food Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program is a major thing that the federal government does to make sure low-income people have enough resources to buy food. And uh, this Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program varies from year to year. In years when the unemployment rate is low, is high, when there's bad economic times, and the un times of recession, 
Like the early 1990s had a recession. And the amount that people are spending on food get in terms of food stamp benefits is going up. In times when there's economic expansion, like in the late part of the Clinton years, right? There was good growth in the national economy. It, it was a long enough economic expansion that it even reached down into the low wage market. Fewer people become eligible for SNAP benefits, and the role of SNAP in our national economy declines over time. So it fluctuates with the macroeconomic cycle. The, um, I put on the vertical axis, I scaled SNAP benefits, the total amount of SNAP benefits, as a percentage of the grocery food retail economy. So I used two different price series, two different um, uh, spending series that USDA has about how much do people spend on groceries. And the idea is of all the, all the food in the grocery stores, what percentage is accounted for by SNAP benefits? That's the question I'm asking. And um, the shocker is that in the recent combination of recession and price increases, that um, soared above 10%. So now that of all groceries in our food retail economy, um, more than 10% is represented by SNAP benefits. Um, SNAP participants are something like 14% of all Americans. So um, this means that I think people should follow the SNAP program no matter what your interest is in the food system. If you care about poor people, that's good. You're probably following this program already. But if you care about the food retail economy, even generally, you have to be aware of this as an important enhancer of food demand. The federal government is doing things to try to, it's taking small steps towards trying to encourage healthier eating through the SNAP program. Traditionally, the SNAP program was fairly non-judgmental about which foods you consumed. There was a voluntary nutrition education program called SNAP-Ed, but it's not like the WIC program where mothers and infants and children get vouchers that are, tell you specifically what to buy, this much carrots, this much um, uh, milk. Instead, uh, instead, SNAP lets people make their own choices. But I'm involved in a uh, pilot study of giving people an incentive, especially through fruit and vegetable, for fruit and vegetables um, through the SNAP program. So the idea is if you go to a retailer, you buy fruits and vegetables, qualifying fruits and vegetables, like excludes French fries and um, fruits and vegetables with sugar added, so jelly doesn't count. Um, uh, you, you get the value, 30% of the value of what you spent on those fruits and vegetables gets added back to your EBT card, the little debit card that you do your grocery spending with. Um, this has an impact on uh, targeted fruit and vegetable intake. Just this summer, these uh, results came out. So this is in cup equivalents per day. <coughs> so how many cups of fruits and vegetables does somebody have as their food intake per day? For the experimental group that had access to this incentive, and a control group randomly assigned that didn't. And there's a difference of about 0.22 cup equivalents per day, which is in one sense a very small difference, right? It seems like almost too little to matter, that much more fruits and vegetables. But um, if you put it on percentage terms, it's like a 25% difference because the control group had so few fruits and vegetables. There's a lot of people in the United States who don't eat much fruits and vegetables at all, all income levels. So the next demand instrument that I think is underappreciated is these checkoff programs. So sometimes I talk too much about these checkoff programs, but I feel like, um, I feel like nobody's paying attention. Um, so these checkoff programs are what's responsible for slogans you may have heard, like beef is what's for dinner, or pork the other white meat. Or, or, I, have you seen any of these? Like. Uh, the milk mustache, or um, got milk, all of these are checkoff sponsored advertising programs. And few people recognize the role of the federal government in these advertising programs. So these programs are not on the federal budget, but they use the federal government's power of taxation to allow a producer board, a private sector producer board, to collect mandatory assessments from the farmers in a particular area of commodity production. So for example, um, for the dairy checkoff, they collect a certain um, payment every time dairy products are sold. And that payment goes into a fund, which then can be used by the producer board to support um, 
issue advocacy related to um, you know new product development or development of the real seal or development of advertising programs like with these slogans that I mentioned and these these checkoff programs are um, f- substantial so compared to any well they're not big compared to the advertising of Coke and Pepsi right so the the total amount of advertising for milk is much smaller than the advertising for sugar sweetened beverages but they're large amounts relative to anything that the federal government does for example to promote um, fruit and vegetable consumption so you think of like the five to nine a day slogan you know we have to be consuming five to nine uh, servings of fruits and vegetables a day um, the total amount that the federal government spends on that program is probably in single digits of millions of dollars you know like seven or nine or or eleven um, million dollars a year and these amounts are in the hundreds of millions right so their total the total is over half a billion half a billion dollars per year that go into these checkoff programs so in one sense they're small but in another sense they're substantial programs and um, if you go to nutrition conferences the, these checkoff programs have a fairly good reputation because I think that um, the dairy program will have a booth all about low-fat milk and the um, it'll, they'll be showing the, the posters that they have in school meals programs encouraging the my plate and um, so forth the, the if you go to nutrition conferences you'd have the impression that the beef program is mostly about the seven leanest cuts of beef right the several, seven selected lean cuts of beef but it's not when they talk to their producers they are very explicit that the goal of these checkoff programs is to increase consumer demand overall because that's what increases both the quantity demanded and the price that the producers get, right? So this is the annual report, the cover of the annual report for the beef board, right? It's 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 saying it's about demand. Um, the even dairy, because dairy is has a better health halo than beef and pork does. Uh, but for dairy, the story is a long-term secular decline in demand for milk, um, offset by a long-term secular overtime increase in demand for cheese. So the dairy board would not be doing its job under the mandate that it's been given if it didn't spend a lot of time thinking about how to get us to eat more pizza, right? And so they do these uh, collaborations. Um, you, you wouldn't think it's possible to get more cheese onto a pizza, but they found space in the crust, right? So the, their new product development people find that uh, by putting more cheese uh, actually into the little empty spaces in the crust, you can get more cheese. Uh, more cheese onto a pizza. Yeah. Did you have a qu- no question? Um, here is uh, pork, the other white meat. So pork, pork. Uh, this pork slogan ended up. I feel a little sometimes like uh, the guy chasing the great white whale. Uh, um, uh, there's more I could tell you about this pork slogan. Um, The government role in checkoff programs, these producer boards will often present themselves as private sector, private sector boards. But the um, government role is central to what makes them work. Any industry can have a trade association where people sort of voluntarily donate some of their funds in terms of dues to be a member of the trade association. And then the trade association can do lobbying and things like that. But these checkoff programs are different. Um, because they're overseen by USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service, because they use the federal government's power of taxation to make the assessments mandatory. Um, they, they used to have producer referenda that provided the justification for them, you know, that there would be a vote every so often, and the producers would have to vote to continue the checkoff. But for all the leading checkoff programs, there hasn't been a producer referendum for a long time, um, decades. And uh, even in the case of pork, the last time there was a producer referendum, um, more than half the votes were to turn down the program, to end the program. And yet still there hasn't, uh, there's there's a whole other story about why the program's still going on. And the third is that um, the the programs got taken to court by dissident farmers, (laughs) by farmers who didn't want to have to do the payment. And the farmers tried all kinds of legal arguments to get out of the payments. And um, most of the legal arguments didn't work. But paradoxically, the one argument that made it through several levels of appeal was the farmer said, this is violating our First Amendment rights. It's forcing us to support advertising with which we disagree. And um, 
So if the beef producer who doesn't want to have to make the mandatory payment makes this claim, um, they're saying that the government is like making me participate in an advertising program that as a business person is not the advertising program that I wanted to support. And the federal government and the checkoff programs had a legal argument in response, which is that it's not like we're requiring you to support some commercial speech with which you disagree. This is just like taxing you so that um, we can do whatever message is the government's own speech. It's like the, everybody recognizes that the government can collect tax money and um, then do an advertising campaign saying, wear your seatbelts or um, let your baby sleep on its back instead of on its tummy so, th so, so that it uh, doesn't have uh, impaired breathing, right? The, 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 the government's allowed to do government speech if it wants, and the argument that was presented to the Supreme Court was that these checkoff programs are just government speech in that way. And so in the, on the one hand, this was a big victory for the checkoff programs that the Supreme Court agreed with this argument. Uh, but on the other hand, it really ties their justification even more tightly to their identity as federal government programs. That they can't really win that argument in the Supreme Court and at the same time say, oh, we're not really government programs. We're really just like any other, we're really just like any other trade association. And uh, so, so that to me, it doesn't make to me any difference um, whether this counts as federal expenditure or whether it counts as a private sector board doing the expenditure. If the assessments are mandatory, um, uh, it seems to me like that's the key issue. But my view on this is not standard. So in the interest of full disclosure, um, uh, you, you won't find um, many people in the Farm Bureau taking this perspective on the, on the checkoff program. Question. Yeah. Um, the other part of that is, so your hit story was a 25% demand increase. For fruits and vegetables, yeah. With caveats, right? And this is a section on demand expansion. Yes. So do um, quality check on programs expand demand? Right. And if so by... Right. So the, the first thing is, I, I bet they're not super effective. Um, but they tell their producers that they're highly effective. So there's almost a small industry in applied economics of doing the evaluation studies that are reliably optimistic about how much value are the producers getting for their, for their um, investment in, in these checkoff programs. Um, Take the example of milk. Milk has been in decline during a period of heavy checkoff advertising for milk. So on the one sense, you could say that, um, that uh, mel the milk advertising hasn't been highly effective. Um, but the evaluations, probably rightly, focus instead on regression analysis using differences in the exposure that different urban markets had in the United States to different amounts of advertising, and they find, um, they, they, they report positive coefficients on the effect of the advertising dollars on, on milk consumption. And the idea is milk would have declined even more if we hadn't had this advertising. And that's the argument that the pork board has to make um, to, to describe the pork checkoff advertising as a success during a period of time when pork and beef have been in decline, um, it has to be, be saying, well, relative to what would have happened, um, that, that, that our advertising was effective. I'm going to skip, skip this slide and talk about advocacy coalitions in general. Because it can happen that, that a person can follow, take an interest as an outsider in U.S. agricultural policy and develop a, uh, an instinct for reform, right? A, a feeling that somebody ought to do better than this. Um, and if you do, my question is sort of you and what army, right? Uh, is that is that uh, just just uh, uh, I think that sometimes people have a political theory that the way to get things done are to tell the truth more often and more loudly. And I, I find that that actually doesn't move policy all that much. And I've spent time thinking about. Who is it that has influence over food and farm policy? And what would it take to provide a coalition that actually would support an alternative farm policy agenda that you might be able to contemplate? And in this picture, 
I've just picked, this is totally not based on empirical evidence. This is just my impressions of where the area of a particular rectangle is proportional to some estimate that I personally hold of how much influence people in a particular in a particular industry or advocacy area have over U.S. farm policy. And um, it's not the exact sizes of the boxes that matter. If you have a different impression of any one of these boxes, you can just sort of resize this yourself in your mind's eye, right? It's not the exact sizes that matter. What matters is the fundamental change of perspective that it takes once one shoulders responsibility for asking what coalition of these boxes that adds up to more than 50% of the total area would support the alternative proposal that you have in mind. If you have, if you have an alternative farm policy in mind, the question is, who would support it? Right? So imagine a farm policy that says, Let's support, let's, let's reorient all the subsidies so that we no longer support large scale corn and soybean landholders, but instead support small and organic farmers, right? There's, there's a good farm policy reform. And once you've given up on just saying so more loudly and more often, um, the question is who is the advocacy coalition that one aims to appeal to with this proposal, right? You've got your small organic and local producers. You might be able to get, um, you know, depending, you might be able to get support from fruit and vegetable growers. Um, but you'd start to ask yourself, what would it take to have that interest appeal to larger public interest organizations? So um, think of what would it take to have that set of proposals appeal to public health nutrition groups or anti-hunger groups? environmental groups or food safety groups, right? Um, even then, even if you add all those up, I think you're still probably shy of 50%, right? So, 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 so even then, you'd have to be asking yourself, um, which major producer groups can we split? In other words, of the large corn producers, corn producers are not really a homogenous group of people. Like everybody else, they have diverse interests. Some of them are motivated by public interest goals. Some of them are um, uh, small. Some of them are larger. So, so th there's a number of ways that you could bring in even more people than just advocacy coalitions into support for good policy. Um, but even within these advocacy coalitions, you'd really have to give up on some internal feuds that have been plaguing advocacy in this area for a long time. Um, when we were talking to Julie, when we were listening to Julie Caswell's presentation, I was reflecting on the current divisiveness between food safety advocates and the small, which I should have colored green, um, the small organic and local producer groups, right? Because, um, I mean, this has been an interesting experience. Um, when food safety is talking about a meat packing plant, I, you know, I'm an economist, right? So I'm always telling people about trade offs. And my students, won't hear it if I'm talking about food safety regulation and a meatpacking plant. If I say, well, don't overregulate. Uh, uh, at some point, at some point, you have to accept that the food safety measures are expensive. They're saying, they'll say, are you trading off the lives of real people against the expense of a meatpacking plant? And I'll say, yeah, but um, uh, you know, there's no there's no measure that could be taken that that would actually. Um, make every last person safe, and we have to accept some level of risk, right? And they'll say, oh, you've been brainwashed by all these uh, neoclassical uh, Chicago school economist types, right? Um, as soon as I start talking about food safety and small organic and local production, immediately everybody can see at a glance that we all have to be recognizing policy trade-offs. So um, I took a tour through the Salinas Valley in California, where a lot of our leafy greens are produced. And the environmentalists in this area are highly distressed by new food safety regulations. In fact, they were distressed even before it was new federal regulations, when it was new measures that the major buyers were instituting, forcing the suppliers to make absolutely sure that there was no E. coli in the leafy green vegetables fields. Because this... Um, Outbreak, there was an outbreak of E. coli 
that caused major disaster for the industry because um, leafy greens aren't cooked, right? Typically, you eat them raw. And so if there's E. coli, there's no kill step in people's kitchens. Um, you have to be very careful not to have E. coli on the leafy greens in the fields. And so what they're doing is they're making sure there's no wildlife in the fields. They've got um, poison bait traps uh, every 50 meters along the edge of the farms. And they have um, fences that wall the whole agricultural region of the Salinas Valley off from the river so that deer can't leave the, the, the actual um, space along the river and walk into the fields. And to, from an environmental perspective, some of this looks very much like a world gone awry, right? This looks like a very bad idea to expect um, our fields to have this kind of sanitation completely free from wildlife. I mean, they're taking down the windrows, the trees that used to be in between fields. They're taking them down so that, so that they can't house wildlife. Um, and if you ask somebody who's an environmentalist who's aware of this issue, what their opinion is about food safety, they will immediately say, you know, on food safety, we have to make some trade-offs, right? You can't get rid of every last hazard. You have to have a sense of balance about what the, what the goal is of, of different um, policy measures that, that you might propose. And so um, exactly these issues mean that food safety advocates, like the Center for Science and the Public Interest, have been very much um, in a ferocious argument with what you might be, you might think are some of the public interest-oriented allies that, that are potential allies as you think about policy reform. So some of these things have to be resolved. Um, yeah. And in the last couple rounds of the Farm Bill, even before the current round, they realized that they weren't going to be able to pass the Farm Bill indefinitely with votes just from those regions. And so they've taken more care to reach out to new constituencies. And so organizations like the Farm Bill have become very savvy about thinking not just about what do corn and soybean producers need, but what do um, produce growers in California and in Florida want from public policy. And um, even the small organic and local, uh, they, they, uh, they back farm bills that include modest amounts of funding for organic agriculture research, for example. So that used to be off the table for USDA. USDA used to think of those people as nuts. And now, um, now uh, the, there's a, a modest size USDA research program on sustainable and organic agriculture. And that's because of the major farm organizations having recognized what it took to put together an advocacy coalition that would back these farm bills. Um, it's all fallen apart this year. It fell apart this year because the traditional bipartisan nature of the farm bill fell apart. And um, the, with the, um, every year, on the agri every five years on the agriculture committees, the Democrats and the Republicans come together and the compromises are usually regional and industry. So they have to make sure that they've brought in enough different regions and enough different industries to get support. But it's not highly partisan. And this year, when the proposed farm bill got to the floor of the House of Representatives, um, it fell apart because the House Republican leadership couldn't get the um, body of the legislators to agree to the food stamp spending. So there was such a such kind of a hatred, really, for the food stamp spending that um, even the bipartisan agreement fell apart this year.